read from 1 Peter chapter 4, beginning with verse 1. Therefore, since Christ has suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same purpose, because he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. So as to live the rest of the time in the flesh no longer, for the lusts of men, but for the will of God. For the time already past is sufficient for you to have carried out the desire of the Gentiles, having pursued a course of sensuality, lusts, drunkenness, carousing, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries. In all this, they are surprised that you do not run with them into the same excesses of dissipation, and they malign you, for they will give account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For the gospel has for this purpose been preached even to those who are dead, that though they are judged in the flesh as men, they may live in the spirit according to the will of God. Amen. While we're working our way through this beautiful letter written by the Holy Spirit through Peter, and we find ourselves a little bit more than halfway through. And um, we have come a long way, and I must say it's been enjoyable, it's been encouraging, it's been edifying, but it's been challenging as well. Um, but it's, it's encouraging to know that this letter was not only written to those that Peter uh, was writing to, to the readers, to the hearers of this letter. Um, it's very relevant to each and every one of us here today, this morning, and all those that read this book. And there's so much truth that Peter actually packs into this letter. And I feel we could start from the beginning again and still not reach the end. But it's not because of Peter. It's because of the vastness of our, of our God. You know, he is unsearchable. And just as we learn in Romans 11, that there are depths that cannot be reached. Um, we, we just stand in awe of his majesty, of his glory. And together with Peter, we say, as he did in verse 3, blessed be the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So there is, and as I like to do at the beginning of each Bible study, is give an overview of where Peter's going and also of what we've learned and maybe different aspects of what we've learned, not always the same thing over again. So Peter began with that there is a great salvation that has been given to us. This salvation, this gospel, this Christ has and continues to change our very being. The, the way we think, the way we walk, the way we talk, we're dead to sin, but we're alive to God. In our relation to sin, we're dead. In our relation to God, we're alive. But we have freedom to praise. We have freedom to glorify him, to honor him. And now and at the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ, verse 7 of chapter 1. But think about this. We who have this great salvation, we, we greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory. Why? Because we love him. Well, how is it that you love him if you haven't seen him? Because we believe in him. Our faith is in him. Well, how is that possible? Well, because, as Peter said, in his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And then you see how wonderfully in, verse, in chapter 1, Peter describes and personalizes this great salvation. In verses 10 through 12, it's to you, um, for you, um, to you again. And he keeps on Referencing it, it was for you. This, this salvation is for you. And, and there have been many who were doing careful searches and, and, and inquiries. They were all looking for this great person and this, and this great time regarding the suffering of Christ and the glories to follow. The coming of Christ and all it entails and all that he brought was not reactionary by God. It's exactly what God has ordained, and it is most good. This is what Peter's getting at. And now this is a great salvation, and what makes it so great is because of our great Savior. 
But Peter doesn't just end there. He doesn't leave this truth just in the intellect, in the mind. To do so would be to miss the whole point of the gospel. The, the gospel, this great salvation, changes lives. It changed my life. It changes your. It changed your life. It continues to change lives. And Peter continues as if someone just stopped him and asked, okay, Peter, in light of all these things that you've mentioned about this great salvation, this great Savior, how are we to live? And, and there he is in, in verses, in verse 14, in 13 and 14 of chapter one, he says, don't let your minds be at ease. He says, be sober in spirit, prepare your minds for action. There is work to be done. It's not just a, an assent to, to believe in Christ, to believe upon Christ, and then he doesn't become your Savior and Lord. There is a faith to fight for. There is no idleness in the Christian life. Lee mentioned it earlier in, in one of his sermons, and, and Michael in one of his chapters in his book, Fight for Faith. There are no pacifists meaning we take up arms and we fight. Uh, yet our weapons are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. They are of God. And so we must be vigilant, awake, not lulled to sleep on the enchanted ground as written in Pilgrim's Progress. We need to be the ones that are transformed by the renewal of our minds. We need to be, as Peter states in chapter 1, verse 14, as obedient children who are not conformed by our former lusts. But know something. We're not conformed by our former lusts, but know something that this great salvation has captured our hearts, has captured our minds, our bodies, our purposes, our very lives, our everything. The call to all is this, and Peter says this, be holy in all your behavior. Be holy because the one who called you is holy. And so Peter begins in chapter 1 and continues through the rest of the letter, admonishing his leaders, his readers, and us how this great, imperishable, blood-bought salvation is to result in godly living. How is it that we are to live in this life as those who have been rescued by Christ, chosen by God? And that even if times of suffering come, and they will, our hope is not in our circumstances, but in the God who controls all things. The God who controls all things and is not oblivious to our circumstances. Rather, he gives strength and encouragement, and he sets Christ forth as our example in suffering. He is our great shepherd and guardian, Peter says. He's our great victor and all triumphant one. He is the ruling and the reigning king of kings and lord of lords. That's marvelous. That's glorious. That's our savior. And so, well, before us, we have in chapter 4, verses 1 through 6, and that served as, a, as an introduction to what will follow and what Peter's getting at. He mentioned it. And we mentioned it briefly here in chapter 1, and he expounds it here in 4. This text is a wonderful text. Of course it's a wonderful text. It's the Word of God. Wonderful because it speaks much of Christ and the power of his resurrection and what a Savior he is. He has not only lived the life we could not, leaving us an example, but also suffered in our place. He partook of a suffering that only he could have endured again, on our behalf. He came out of that suffering, rose in great victory and triumph. The Father did not abandon his soul to Hades. In Hades, he is at the right hand of God. And what a precious gift we have received because of what Christ has accomplished on our behalf, the resurrection of Christ. And because he lives, we have the Holy Spirit and have the power of God in us to help us to live lives that align, that agree with and reflect the redemption that Christ has accomplished. You know, I'm amazed at the love of God in doing this for me. As Peter personalized in the first chapter, it's for you. 
I stand amazed that it was for me, that God did this for me, the work of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It's, it's really beyond any human understanding or thought. It's beyond my comprehension, but it's enough for me to say, I believe it, and I am astonished, and I am a recipient of it. Praise the Lord. And so Peter, in these next six verses, lays out for the scattered aliens, of which we are also, how they are to live in the contemporary culture, the sin-filled culture they were very much a part of. But now, because of the gospel of Christ, they are living separate from that. They are separated from that, from that lifestyle or that worldly way of living. Again, I have said it before, and I think it's good for us to know that, that Peter um, mentions that there will be suffering for the sake of righteousness, and, and that we will suffer for the sake of righteousness for doing that which is right. And the reason and the method for suffering, it will differ from age to age and person to person. It will look different, but nonetheless, it will happen. And I ask you, as we begin here, and just thinking about what we've covered so far, how relevant the Word of God is. How relevant this letter is to our very day that we live in, the very day we live in. There's, there's much to learn from this study as to how we are to live in this sin-filled world, a world that was and still is against Christ and against all that pertains to his kingdom. So see with, this, with me this morning in verses 1 through 6. I've broken it up into three parts. The mind of Christ, the power of Christ, and the judgment of Christ. So the mind of Christ, the power of Christ, and the judgment of Christ. I'll be spending most of my time on the first point because I think that it does bring, uh, set the tone for what follows. So here, as before, Peter is setting forth Christ. For who else is our example but Christ? We, we always need to see Scripture as in the lens of Christ, seeing Christ high and lifted up, seeing Christ as our example, seeing Christ in everything. And in this letter in particular, Peter is bringing forth the suffering of Christ, the death of Christ, and relates that to our own suffering. And I don't think that Peter, in spite of what other commentators think, I don't think Peter ever lost sight of that in the previous text we covered last time in verses 18 through 22. I think that he is very much on par of bringing forth the suffering of Christ, the death of Christ. And so using that logical conjunction there, the therefore, Peter is not only harking back to the previous section, verses 18 through 22, but more um, specifically, and even verse 17, but more specifically, the benefits that come as a result of what Christ has done. The outcome of the suffering as found in chapter 3, verse 18, is this. He brought us to God. That's the outcome. You remember that, right? The death of Christ for sins once and for all, the just for the unjust, to bring us in order that he might bring us to God. And in the background is also, in the background of what Peter is saying here, and the therefore is chapter 2, the end of chapter 2, where we see similar vocabulary and structure. We see that in verse 21, for you have been called for this purpose since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example to follow in his footsteps, in his steps. And later on in verse 24, Peter says, He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. So here in the first verse of chapter 4, we are reminded again that Christ suffered in the flesh, in his body, to the point of death, even death on the cross. Well, knowing this, Peter then proceeds in admonishing us to arm ourselves with the same purpose. You see those words there, arm yourselves. Actually, it's one word in Greek, but that, that's a military term. Peter is likening our, our living here on this earth to a battlefield, a spiritual war that is constant. It's not like the wars we, we heard of in the past that it's break time. Everybody go home, take a, take a rest. Uh, get some sleep, we'll resume war in the morning. It's not that kind of war. It's a constant warfare. Therefore, we also must be vigilant because our enemy, 
does not sleep. Indeed, both Paul and Peter mentioned that the battle is between the flesh and the spirit. The taking up of the armor of God is something that we are told to do. And the fighting against sin, being vigilant and sober, is something that Peter mentions about that roaring lion as well. So Peter says, arm yourselves with the same purpose, same intention, thought, mindset. What is that mindset that Peter is referring to? The word same points us to Christ again. And and what was the mind of Christ in suffering? Chapter 3, verse 17. It is better to suffer for doing that which is right than to suffer for doing what is wrong. You know, his purpose, his mindset laid in the fact that he was doing the will of God. That, That was the right thing to do, the will of God. And if anyone suffered for doing right, not wrong, it was Christ. He only only did what was right. He never did that which is wrong. He suffered the most. But the mind of Christ was this. I will suffer. I will die. I will give myself. Because in doing this right thing, the will of the Father, the Father will be glorified. Having this mindset, Christ knew that his death will bring and does bring freedom, deliverance. He broke the power of sin and death so that we may die to sin, Peter says, and live to righteousness so that he may bring us to God. But moving on to the more difficult section of this verse, um, there have been several interpretations of how to understand the last portion of verse 1, that he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. And just when I thought that we were clear of 18 through 22, here's verse 1, He who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. Well, what does that mean? Well, first, what does it not mean? It does not mean that Christ suffered in the flesh and has now ceased from sin. There are people who think that this is referring to Christ who has suffered in the flesh, but not necessarily has ceased from sin. We know that he was without sin as Peter reminded us in the last part of chapter 2. He is without sin. He's blameless. Christ even mentions it when he tells his disciples that the ruler of this world is coming and he has nothing in me, nothing in regard to me. It also does not mean that all who suffer stop sinning. It also does not mean that all who suffer stop sinning, meaning they sin no more. There are numerous passages to combat that idea. If we say we have not sinned, we make God, him, a liar, and his word is not in us. Okay, I think those two were pretty obvious. But what does it mean? And here's where I, I want to propose two uh, major views I landed on. Not that I landed on, but that I really condensed that those who are suffering in the flesh, view one, those who are suffering in the flesh for doing what is right, and and remember that we are talking about suffering in the context of or because you have chosen to obey God for doing that which is right. This This is what doing that which is right is meaning. So those who are suffering for doing what is right, in that suffering, the sufferer, is clearly demonstrating that they have made a break with sin and in turn are committed to obeying God despite or even amid their suffering. So there has been a a ceasing from sin, a stopping from sin, a deadness to sin. Okay, another view would be that this suffering in the flesh really means physical death. Um, and, And they would look back at verses 18 through 22 and say that this was what the suffering that Christ did, the suffering that's mentioned in the same word in verse 18, although in verse 22 is referring to death, a different word, that that's the conclusion to follow, that suffering in the flesh really means physical death. And so it means here in in 1a and 1b, the thought is this, that he who has died really has stopped sinning. That when we die physically, when one dies physically, we have stopped or ceased from sin in the body. 
Now, both are true statements. Both are true. And we see the word ceased. Um, and if we would look at the way it's written, the way Peter wrote it, we would notice something. That in the original, it's written in the perfect passive tense, which means this, that the action took place at one time in the past, a one-time action that has lasting effects. That's what in the perfect means. The passive, that it's really something that was done outside of onto a person. So it's been acted upon the person outside of himself. And we can see that what Peter means by the word sin is not a power that controls humans, but rather they are acts of sin that align with the lusts of the flesh and against or contrary to the will of God. And we can make that statement because of what verse 2 and verse 3 actually say, which both have to do with sin actions. So with that in mind, I would lean more on the first view and read what one commentator said. The point here is that the suffering that the Christians undergo at the hands of their ungodly opponents demonstrates that such sufferers no longer live in ways opposed to God's will. We see that in verse 2, what Peter is getting at. If we have the same mindset as Christ, following the will of God, then we will no longer live the rest of the time in the flesh on this earth for the lusts of men, but like Christ, we will live for the will of God. And suffering proves that. Suffering proves that. For the one who suffers is the one who has ceased. There has been a stop to the sinning that was against the will of God. The defining moment of when that happened was when they believed upon the Savior, upon the Christ, upon the one who died once and for all, the just for the unjust, so that he may bring us to God. And since then, there have been lasting effects of what has been accomplished there. And wasn't that a great confession you and I were awakened to? I choose to follow Christ, to be like Christ. And if Christ followed and obeyed God perfectly, and he followed the will of God, well, then I, as I follow Christ, will do the same. So with this mindset, while we're still on this earth, Peter says, in the flesh, live life. But in such a way, you are to live life that in your living, you are not pursuing after the lusts of men or the sinful passions of this world, but for the will of God. Now, how count countercultural is that? Well, it was applicable in his time. And may I say that it's really applicable in our time as well? But that is the mind of Christ. It's, it's doing the will of God. And so we are, we are to know this, as, as Paul mentions in Romans 6. He says, for the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, so that you obey its lusts. And what are we to do, Paul? Do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. We live a life that is actually governed by the will of God and not the desires of the flesh. The lusts of men, equivalent to what Peter says in the next verse, the, the desire of the Gentiles can be understood as desiring that which is forbidden, that which God prohibits, that which is contrary to the word of God. If God says you are not to do this and you do it, then you're desiring something that is contrary to what God says don't do. And Peter will elaborate on this in the next few verses as he gives examples. But I think we can gather this from these verses, something that should be an encouragement to all of us, really. You are willing to suffer. You're willing to suffer in the body precisely because you have died to sin. Because you are willing to give up self. Because you are committed to putting Christ ahead of yourself. It's about Christ. And so the willingness to suffer for living a life according to the will of God 
shows or demonstrates that we have died to sin. We have died to self, meaning to our own desires, our own way of life. It's not about me. I, I'm not the, the focus or the agenda here, the agenda focus. I take up my cross and follow after him, after Christ. And suffering, in a way, is a test of faith. Are you going to live for the will of God or for the lusts of men, this world? Grudem says this, Peter here seems to be saying that obeying God, even though the price is physical suffering, involves an even stronger moral commitment than that first decision of the will. It's not over at I choose Christ. We continue to follow after him. We continue to live a life. And Peter continues, and so must we, to the second point, the power of Christ, the power of Christ. There is a reason Peter gives us as to why we are no longer to live according to the desires of men or the desires of the Gentiles, both the same. It's because the time has already passed. And the time that has already passed is sufficient for you to have carried out those desires. In other words, you already spent enough time pursuing those things and doing that which the pagans, the unbelievers, those in the world without God have been chasing after and doing and filling themselves with. That time is over. You've already had that time. That's what Peter's getting at. He says, enough already. Think about that for a moment. That those who are um, truly converted, how, how, would, how would they, how would you react to a statement like that in regards to uh, the time already passes sufficient for you to have carried out the desires of the Gentiles? You know, some in giving their own testimony, some who call themselves Christians, Maybe they are. Maybe early in their walk, they're just a little bit more um, foolish. But in giving their testimony, spend the bulk of their time in an almost entertaining and boastful way, detailing how they used to live their lives before they accepted Christ or came to Christ. They, they talk about how they reached their limits in their, in their sinning and that others did not as if they were the best at sinning. Uh, hardly something to boast about. Um, but to the converted... We look at that statement that says that Peter just made and say, oh, those wasted years. Those wasted years. I, I would desire for them to be erased, for them to be remembered no more. And we think back at our early years and say, if, if only this and only that, if I only would have done this or that, and then the Holy Spirit reminds us but God. Because he works all things for good. I wouldn't be who I am without my sins committed outside of Christ. And I wouldn't know Christ as I know him now without the sins committed outside of Christ. And you see Peter is saying that the, that the time that has passed is sufficient regarding your sin, regarding your way of life, of what you were doing, of what you have done. It's enough. And if at any moment you are tempted to indulge again, know this, it is sufficient no more. That's it. Why? Because you're dead to sin, but alive to Christ. That's why. Because you live for God's will, for his purposes. Your devotion has shifted, changed completely. You were once devoted to fulfilling the desires of the flesh, and now you're devoted to fulfilling the will of God. You're in full obedience to him. And that means that you are willing to suffer for that. You're willing to suffer for doing that which is right, for following after the will of God. And that anything or anyone that attempts to sever that devotion cannot. You will endure. You will suffer to the end. For the end is guaranteed. That's what we just learned about in verses 18 through 22. It's, it's guaranteed. Christ is victorious. Christ is triumphant. And we serve the triumphant, the victorious one. We serve Christ. We're fully devoted to him. Well, Peter begins in, in, verse, in 
three there to list out some specific sins that the Gentiles do. And he, he goes through and just lists them and not necessarily accusing them of or steering them away from those things now necessarily, but reminding them. And they are pretty self-explanatory. They have to do with the more common or obvious sins that are committed or fall under the category of the lusts of the flesh. And Peter brings out these various sins pertaining to the body, the flesh. And I, I, would, I would think the reason as to why these particular ones are brought up could be for several reasons. One, it could be because the way of life in, this, in that culture that he is uh, writing in, well, that's the way they lived. That's what they participated in, in, in the um, worship of, of emperors and, and other festivals and uh, sorts of um, ungodly things they did. But it's relevant, to, it's relevant to them as to why Peter is writing about these particular sins. And it's what they were pulled out of. It's what they it's, the, it, it's what was their way of life. That's the way they lived. May I say that it's not too far off to the life that many live today? Very much so. And so it's still relevant today. Maybe a different context, same sin. Secondly, Peter is trying to relate to his readers this very thing, that Christ, that Christ is our example that Christ suffered in the body and that he was in, in full obedience with all body, mind, and soul to the will of God. And that when we suffer for doing what is right, we will suffer in the flesh, in the body. No matter which way you look at it, the sins pertaining to the body, those committed with the body, the flesh, are dangerous and bring destruction to the body, bring destruction to the mind, to the soul, so there is, in a sense, a suffering for that which is wrong when committing those sins. But there's also a suffering for that which is right, a suffering in the body by resisting or refusing to sin with the body. And I hope that, that makes sense. Um, but maybe some of Peter's readers may be thinking this, and maybe some of you may be thinking this. Well, that, that's not the course I took in the past. Maybe I was raised in a Christian home. Maybe I didn't dabble with those particular sins. And Peter's trying to get something across here. He's not just leaving it to a, a list, that if you don't fill this list, then you're excused. He's saying that the desires of the Gentiles at the root are the same desires that drive everyone who is not in Christ. It is a desire that manifests itself in the idolatry of self. It is all about bringing satisfaction to self, which is controlled by the sinful nature that is demanding you to feed it more and more evil, more and more sin and wickedness. You may not have been carrying out the same sins or in the same manner, but you had the same problem, the same infection, the same disease, possibly manifested in a different way. But what I want us to see is what Peter writes in verse 4. And I think this is what Peter's getting at. Because this, is, this will bring forth a greater reality of what has taken place and what can take place for anyone who is still living a, a life of sin, a self-centered and godless life, which leads to an empty pursuit and total destruction in the end. It is this. Peter says, in all of this, in all your sinning regarding the time that has already passed, that what marked you, the crowd you used to run with, they are surprised that you don't join them any longer into the same excesses of dissipation, which really means in an unrestrained, uncontrolled indulgence in the seeking of pleasure. It's the loose living that the prodigal son was, was living, was acting out. They are surprised and it's seems almost as if they are looking for an answer to the question of why not, or the tempting question or suggestion just this once, one more time. And they're wondering, why is it that you're not coming with us any longer? Why is it that you're not joining in to these sins that we've all joined into and committed? Well, their answer, your answer, 
My answer, the power of Christ. It's the power of Christ. He says, listen, it's almost as if your accomplices, your, your old crowd you used to run with, they are the ones that share the same purpose, same end goal, governed by the same power, the power of sin. That's, that's what we were under as well, living lives that were completely opposite to the will of God, contrary. And not only are they surprised, but you're surprised. You're surprised as well. For them, it's that foolish religion. For you, it's the power of Christ. You stand in awe for what difference is there between you and the one that you are running with, the one that you've committed sins with, the ones that you spent your early years, maybe the former years, the wasted years with. What's the difference? They may still be pursuing those things and you are not. It's the power of Christ. It's nothing aside from the grace and mercy of God in Christ Jesus that you are able to even be here today and hear this message and rejoice that you have been rescued. It is the deep, deep love of Jesus, a love like no other. And like Thomas, you now see, you believe the power of Christ is able to deliver you and me from sin and to enable us to live lives that are for the will of God. Brethren, this is not just another self-help or try-harder campaign that Peter's putting forth here. That's, that's not what it is. This is the work of God in your life, the power of the resurrected Christ. And I repeat those wonderful verses for our reminder and edification and encouragement because I've been doing so to bring home a point so that we can rest in this truth that he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. That Christ also died for sins once and for all, the just for the unjust, for the purpose of, so that he may bring us to God. You see the power of Christ. You see that he's able to break the chains of sin. And that it's ongoing. He he, he empowers us to, to also live a life that is now able to do the will of God. It's amazing. My desires were not for God. Clearly, they were not for God. They were about me. All about me. And my own selfish gratification. And fulfillment. But not only are they surprised, but Peter mentions that they malign, they slander, they're hostile towards you. And they speak evil of you. You know, those who attended to your desires, those who participated in the acts of sin are now being hostile towards you. But why would they do that? Why is it that when you break with sin, when that happens, when you cease from doing those acts of sin, why is it that they malign you? Well, it's because you took a stance and you armed yourself, as Peter said, with the same mind as Christ. You live for the will of God in full obedience to his purposes for your life because you are dead to sin, alive to Christ. Sin has no control or power over your life. The power of Christ has accomplished this in and for you. But you see, there's something in them that recognizes the fact that they stand condemned of their sin. And you are walking away from that lifestyle. You're walking away from it. You're leaving them on the other side, so to speak. In other words, you not joining them condemns them. And so as a result, that bothers their conscience. They don't like it. And so someone is going against that which they enjoyed and still enjoy. That sin, they like it. And so you're, you're coming against their, their baby, if I could put it that way. So they hold, what, what they hold on to. And so what do they do? They attack. They blaspheme. You with their words or in, in their opposition, it may even be Uh, resulting to your suffering in the body. But all of this because of the God you worship and the God you obey. 
suffering for doing that which is right. This is what Peter is getting at, the power of Christ. Peter wants us to know something here. They may speak evil of you. They, they may even cause suffering beyond what the words can do. It may be even, and go read church history, read even today, of the martyrs. They may even put you to death. But know this, and this leads us to our third point, that, that they will give an account to him who judges the living and the dead. You see the flow that Peter has going on over here. You know, reading in verse 5, that very verse, that he will judge the living and the dead, we, we, in, the background, in the back of our minds, we're thinking, he said this somewhere. Yeah, he did in chapter 2. He said this about Christ. He said that while being reviled, he did not revile in return. He said that while suffering, he uttered no threats. He said, but he kept entrusting himself to the one who judges righteously. That was Christ's attitude. And Peter says, arm yourselves with the same mindset, the same mind, the same thought as Christ. As Christ trusted his Father, we also entrust ourselves to the one who judges righteously. That, that's our hope. That's our encouragement. This is what Peter's, he's trying to encourage his readers. Press on. And there's been discussion around the question of who is the one that would judge, the Father, the Son, and I'm not even going to get into that. Um, can I just make a statement? Acts 17, 31, he, the Father, has fixed the day in which he will judge Christ, the world in righteousness, that he, God, will judge the world in righteousness through a man, Christ, whom he has appointed, having furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead. There are clear references of both. God and Christ. And really, it will be an act of the triune God. Rest assured on that. So I'm not going to get into the details. Uh, but Peter probably is referring to Christ as judge here because of the title he assigns, which is also in Acts chapter 10, verse 42. But why, why verses 5 and 6? This is what I want to get at. Why verses 5 and 6? What does that do for the believer that is suffering because of the slander and those who are trying to live for the will of God in an evil and perverse world. Well, verse 5 is to be an encouragement to Peter's readers. It's to remain faithful. It's to understand that Christ as the triumphant one is also the judge. And he cannot be the judge if he isn't the triumphant one. He can't be the judge if he hasn't risen from the dead. Therefore, don't give up and don't give in. The suffering, as Peter mentioned in the first chapter, is for a little while. And it doesn't compare to the glory that follows, says Paul. They are to persevere. You're to persevere in the faith, even if it means to the point of death. Hold on. Keep going. Arm yourself in the same manner as Christ did. Stay strong. Live in obedience to God and the will of God. They are to know. You are to know that Christ is the one that has the authority. He loves righteousness and hates iniquity. He has wisdom to discern truth and the power to execute judgment. That's J.I. Packer. Above all, he is ready. You see that there in that verse. It says he's ready. Well, what does that mean? Well, he's ready because he is the triumphant one. He is the victorious one. His work is finished. He came he lived, he suffered, he died, he rose, he is ruling and reigning, he's coming again. The judgment remains. The judgment remains, and he is ready. And so there is this truth, that reality, that a day is coming in which Christ as judge will judge both the living and the dead. And here I think Peter is not making a reference to those who are spiritually alive or dead, but rather to all mankind from all ages. It is an interesting and encouraging phrase considering the context, that those who seem to have the upper hand, the last word, those who are dishing out insults and slanderous words, all of those who have a role in the suffering of the saint, that they will have to give an account to the judge of heaven and earth. But as for you, referring to, and if I can summarize verse 6 here, you are to know this, that in light of this coming judgment, the gospel has gone and continues to go forth. For example, and Peter gives this in verse 6, there are those who are dead now 
Yet, when they were alive, they heard the powerful message of the gospel and believed. They were judged in the flesh as men, meaning that they all suffered death because of the judgment of death that was still and remains on all mankind. It is appointed for men to die once, and then comes judgment, Hebrews 9. But for the believer, the very next verse, verse 28 of Hebrews 9, so Christ also, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time for salvation without reference to sin, to those who eagerly await him. The reason Peter is, is writing verse 6 may have been because the accusers of the opponents of the gospel were ridiculing the faithful saints, claiming that they are alike, that there is no difference. Everyone dies. Or even as Peter says in 2 Peter, that they, they keep on ridiculing, they keep on saying, well, where is this promise of his coming. We have not seen it. He's not coming. But here is the purpose for the gospel that was preached and which they believed in the very gospel that you believe. The purpose is this, that they may, that you may live in the spirit according to the will of God. You see, the gospel of Christ clears them from any condemnation. We know that from Romans, right? There's now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And that is so wonderful. Now, think about what Peter began with in verse 2, saying that, making a reference to living the rest of the time in the flesh, not for the um, desires of men, but for the will of God. So the rest of the time on this earth to live for the will of God and now transitions to what it will be like when the living on this earth in the flesh ceases, ends. When it comes to an end, he says in verse 6 there that we shall then live in the spirit according to the will of God. You see, it's always about living in accordance to the will of God. And it's something that is glorious and wonderful. Well, amen. Just as an end, as an encouragement, I just want to read something for you all of what Paul wrote to Timothy in regards to this. I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires and will turn away their ears from the truth and will turn aside to myths. But you be sober in all things, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. In the future, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Amen. Be faithful, brethren. Let us pray. Father, we do thank you. Lord, there's just so much there and so little covered. Lord, I trust that you would do so much more. Work in our hearts, Lord. We want to live lives that are pleasing before you, doing your will, knowing in the end, Lord, that we shall reign with Christ, the all-victorious one. We love you and praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.